All right, now I'm recording. Uh, questions about clicking scores. Yes. The question is, is there a way that we can keep track of like the grade that we get on it? Yeah, there is. Um, just count out how many, in, in, in the grade book it says, you know, your score and then it says out of, and then, you know, five or seven or a hundred or whatever it happens to be. So keep track of the out of number for the clicker data and add those all up and then add up all of your number and if it's 85 percent ding and a little bit later in the semester to probably after the first exam I'll show you how to calculate a grade um, if you're less than 85 percent but it is in your syllabus so you can you know follow the syllabus procedure another question Is that a question or a stretch? Good. All right, hey. All right good. Let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about the, you better jot this table down. We're going to talk about every single orbit in this table. Earth, Mars, Mercury, Pluto, Wild 2. That's a comet. Wild 2 is a comet that we're going to study isotopes for. It's pretty sweet because it tells us quite a bit. Um, the semi-major axis, A, lowercase a, uh, I've got it listed in two columns, uh, astronomical units and light seconds. And just for um, bookkeeping purposes, uh, one astronomical unit in light seconds is about 500. It's, so that's what I go. I go 500 light seconds. It takes 500 seconds for a photon of light to leave the surface of the SUN and reach Florida, the Sunshine State. Except not today because uh, we got a little bit of cloud. Is it still raining out there? It's stinking rain. I'm starting to get sick of it. All right, now the fourth column over, uh, E, that's the eccentricity. Eccentricity is a numerical ratio. It doesn't have a unit. So I wouldn't write it as so many astronomical units. I wouldn't write it as so many light seconds. It's just a ratio of two distances. So it's in physics we would call it dimensionless. It's a dimensionless ratio. And for Earth it's pretty small. Mars 0.0935 and you can see I've got them arranged in order of increasing eccentricity. Earth is pretty pokey for eccentricity, 0 0.0167. And Mars has got a little bit more. Mercury's got a little more. Pluto even more. And then, whoa, wild too. A lot of comets have really eccentric orbits. <clears throat> and uh, But some of them don't. You know, some of them have really big orbits that are real circular or almost circular. But WILD2 is a 0 0.540 eccentricity. And um, so I'm going to be asking you some clicker questions. Go ahead and get your clicker ready if you haven't uh, gotten it out yet. Uh, and we're going to be operating, what do we do? Frequency B, B? A, A. Okay, so... Uh, Frequency AA. Okay, and uh, here you go. Use that one today. And bring it back at the end of class. Um, so, yeah, it's astronomical unit, 93 million miles. I learned that in like sixth grade. Uh, 150 million kilometers. That's just a conversion. Uh, light seconds, that's really a lot better of a distance unit in the solar system. Um, hey, can somebody divide uh, Pluto's uh, semi-major axis in light seconds? Can you divide that by 3,600, 3,600? 
19,688. That should be uh, about five or so. Anybody get 5.46? Raise your hand if you got, okay, 5.46, good. All right, so that means it's about 5.46 light hours. You can squeeze that in on your table if you want, 5.4. So in other words, not just minutes, but hours, all the way out to Pluto. And uh, to get you thinking about this particular solar system and the precise shape of the solar system, I have a um, visual challenge question for you on iClicker right now. Okay, so turn your, your clicker on. And let me start the question here. Here it is. Which, which orbit below frequency AA? And if this is the first time you're using your iClicker, uh, hold the power button down until you get the flashing square and then hit the letter A twice and you'll be on board. Which one is a perfect circle? So this is a visual, you know, this is like in the NFL. This is a judgment call. This is you being the referee making the judgment call. Which one is a perfect circle? I defy you. Or are they both perfect circles? Or is neither of them a perfect circle? What have we got? 15 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, let's uh, stop this, uh, see what you guys voted for. Hmm. We ha what? Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Two people voted for A, 11 for orbit K. Uh, so nobody believes that those are perfect circles, neither one of them. Some of you said neither. Uh, no, some of you said both. And some of you said neither. It's very interesting. And let me just clue you in on what we've got here. Orbit 88 is the perfect circle. And hardly, and only two people voted for... Raise your hand if you voted for cir circle 80 or for orbit 88. One and two. Geniuses. But this is, guess what this one is? This is the sh exact shape of Mars's orbit. And I designed it very carefully. This one's a perfect circle. And this one's the shape of Mars's orbit. And Kepler was smarter than you. Well. Smarter than all but two of you guys. Uh, he, he spotted that as an ellipse. Can you believe that? All right, so let's, let's do a comparison of these two. All right, here we go. This one's the perfect circle. This one's Mars's orbit. This one over here in blue, that is an eccentric ellipse. Eccentricity 0.09 something. You just wrote that down in your table. Now, I'm going to show you um, how to kind of visually judge that. Let me turn the lights down a little bit. All right. This might help you see better. All right. Now, I'm going to put a perfect square of the same size as this perfect circle uh, right behind it. Right, there it is. All right. Now, if you look at that carefully, this is blue, the square is blue, and the outline of the perfect circle is black. If you look at that left and right, top and bottom, uh, there's no daylight in there. That's, you know, it's a perfect circle and a perfect square. 
All right, so right at this point right here, they should be just tangent. All right, there won't be any daylight behind there. All right, now visually, that's what you would expect for a perfect circle. Copernicus, Aristotle, Plato, all those cats, all the way back to Aristarchus and all the ancient Greeks, they were thinking about circles, and it is certainly um, a legitimate idea. But Kepler spotted that this one over here is actually an ellipse. So let me move the same square over here to the Mars orbit, and let's see how the perfect square shapes up with this one. Here we go. Anybody see any daylight? Top or bottom, left or right? We got any daylight on the right? I don't see any daylight over there. The bottom? Yeah, look at the bottom. Check that out. That's what Kepler saw. That's like ultra detective genius. All right, and that's what and that's what the two guys in this class that voted for uh, for Circle eighty eight they spotted that too. So this is amazing. All I can say to, about Kepler is nice work, excellent. All right, now. We're going to, uh, I want you to do some sketching now and try to do your best. Make sure you have plenty of space. Go to the next page of your notebook paper if you have to. You got to have some room to roam. Now, this is, the, this is the same ellipse that I was just using for Mars. This is the one that's got some daylight. When you put um, a perfect square uh, around it, you get some daylight. Um, in one of the dimensions of it. Now, I'm going to take that out of the way, and what we're going to do, we're actually going to start with Earth's orbit, and we're going to center Earth's orbit on the page. All right, now Earth is elliptical in its orbit, but on this scale, you can't, you can't draw Earth's orbit. I mean, on my software. I can't go fractions of a pixel in my software. You know, you know, maybe some fancier software, you know, like, I don't know, maybe Photoshop, you could do it a little bit better. But I can't do it in the software. But, okay, so here's, go ahead and draw the center of your diagram. And this is the very center of my keynote page, right? And here's Earth's orbit. And in this... Uh, in this scale, one astronomical unit is 150 pixels. All right, so this baby's 300 pixels across. All right. And there's Earth's orbit. Now, um, I'm going to remove my crosshairs. You keep them in there if you want. I'm going to try to make mine a little bit uh, less cluttered. So... I'll just put this green plus sign there. Now that signifies the center of Earth's orbit. But Earth's orbit is not a circle, so that's not where the sun is. The sun is at one of the foci of Earth's orbit. And here comes the sun. I'm bringing it in. There it is, coming down from the upper right. All right there's the S-U-N, that little green circle. All right. Now, right now, it's at the center of Earth's orbit, the center of my page. But that's not where it actually is. It's a little bit over. So just kind of put a dot just a little bit over. All right? And it's very hard to tell that that's not... I mean, if I take out the pl that big green plus sign, it's very hard to tell that that circle is not in the middle. Now, I want to make it a little bit more visible for you. Uh, so I'm going to put in a bigger green circle. Now the sun in this diagram is not to scale. The orbits are to scale and they are um, in the right proportion, uh, semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, 
and fo focal point. All right, so here's Earth, and the Sun is here, pretty close to the center, but not quite. And this, if, if we did the Sun to scale, it would be a little dot down there that you could hardly see. But this is the location of it. All right, um, Mars. Now here's the red outline of Mars. This is an ellipse. All right, but this one, um, I've sent right now, this one's centered at the center of my page, but it's elliptical, and so it's got to orient itself so that the focal point of this ellipse is where the center of the, is where the sun is. So I'm going to push this a little bit to the left. There it is. Try to draw that in your, in your diagram. I see some people erasing. That's good. Hopefully you can do a good, careful uh, sketch of this. And now you can see, if you look at this, now you can maybe believe that Kepler was thinking ellipses. Because this, if you get everything in its place, yeah, this is an ellipse. It's definitely eccentric. It's off-center. The sun is off-center. It's not in the center of the ellipse. It's down here at the foci. And I computed the foci, or the focus, is about 43 pixels uh, away from the center. All right, so, so that's why I moved um, Mars to where it is. And I figured out the, the location of the foci for everything that we're going to do today. All right, so here's Mars, uh, and here's Earth. All right. Now, I want to give you the ellipse for the orbit of Mercury, but let me pause for questions to see if you uh, need some extra uh, information on this diagram. Yes, question. Good question. What are we looking for? What are we looking at? What we're looking for is wisdom. What we're looking at is a diagram. Why are you laughing? I'm not making fun. I, that's what we're... Philosophy is the love, the love of wisdom. That's what we're... You know, that's what this whole thing is. We're trying to find the wisdom in these measurements. You know, what is the meaning of them? And what we're looking at is a view like from the North Star, looking down on the solar system. And hey, you guys, make a side note. Almost all of the orbits in the solar system are on the same plane. You know, Mars and, and, you know, and Venus, they're tilted a little bit, a few degrees, you know, but pretty much everything is... Now, the comets are not like that. Comets come from all different angles. But the planets are all kind of on the same level. Okay, so you, so, and, and this diagram, what is your name again? Uh, Matt. Matt? Yeah. Okay, Matt, this diagram is a diagram of the orbits of the planets looking down from, like, the North Star as if they were all in the same orbital plane. Now, in reality, they're a little bit off, but not, but this is, this is fairly good. And it helps us to understand, you know, or to get wisdom about the arrangement of the planets and, and what Kepler saw, and what Kepler and his three laws meant, and still mean in this day. Another question. Yes? Uh, by observation? I mean, in other words, the sun's already there. It's been there since the beginning. It's the way nature works. The, sun is, uh, the star is at the focal point of every planetary orbit everywhere in the universe, uh, Earth is at, the, is at the focal point of the orbit of the moon. You know, the orbit of the moon is not a perfect uh, circle either. It's close, but you can look up the eccentricity for the moon's orbit. So the, the idea is, you know where the Earth is, um, you know where Mars is, you know where the Sun is, and you just kind of work out the trig. And I'll so say you got a lot of triangulation to do, you know, a lot of Pythagorean theorem. Uh, a lot of, you know, trig, stuff like that. And you just plot it out. And, and, and Kepler did this. I mean, he's the one that said, whoa, 
all these planets, the sun is right at the, at the focus or pretty darn close. You know, close enough for government work, as they say. And he said, boy, that's got to be a pattern. And it is. And we see it for, you know, that, you remember that big Sagittarius A star that we were looking at on Tuesday? Dead on the money, right at the focus of that ellipse. So you look at the ellipse, once you got the major and the minor axes, you can figure out where the, the, the focal points are going to be. And then one of them, doesn't matter which, I mean, it, it's going to be one of them. Uh, and the other one's just some, you know, uh, artifact of, of, the, of the math. In other words, the physical significance of that other point is nil. I mean, mathematically it's significant, but physically it's not. Uh, so you just measure, you get your semi-major, you get your semi-minor, and you time it if you can, and you figure out where your focus is. And then you look there for the, for the black hole. I mean, if, if it's a sun and a planet, you know where the sun is because you can see it. And, but, but if it's a black hole, you know where to look, either one of those two, and then finally you see where it is and stuff like that. So, and if you, if you track the orbit, if you time the orbit, you know that it's gonna, the, the black hole is going to be at the focus on the end of the orbit, you know, one end or the other, but it's going to be on the end where it's moving the fastest. So where it's really covering a lot of ground every year, that's the end that's going to have the actual gravitating object, the black hole. Another question. Yes. Is there any theory about why planets are on ellipses as opposed to a perfect circle. <sighs> yeah, we, the, in, a, in, a, in one sentence, nature is messy and not symmetric. You know, when the solar system, you know, when you look at pictures like through this Hubble Space Telescope, you see these swirling, dirling clouds of gas and dust and stuff like that is how um, our solar system formed. And they're not perfectly symmetrical. And so if, if they're out of symmetry, they're going to start to spin, you know. And when they start to spin, then, you know, it's still not going to be perfectly symmetrical. And some of the things that condense into planets um, and asteroids and comets and stuff, they're not going to have perfectly symmetric. And then once the planets are formed, they can knock something out. They can, you know, they can give it a boost of velocity or slow it down a little bit, and that'll change it from being a perfect circle. All right? And so the interesting thing is, is that the planets are almost all, except for Pluto, the planets are all very close to perfect circles. So a lot of that um, discombobulation because, of not, not, because it's not symmetric, that didn't really happen too much for our planets. But the thing it did that, that did get a lot of discombobulation is comets. You know, the... Sorry, this guy's head is, keeps getting in the way here. Um, the asteroid belt just is floating around out there between Mars and, and Jupiter, happy as a clam. Not enough to make a real big planet, but never got a chance because Jupiter's there keeping it all stirred up and, and it never is going to have a chance to condense into a planet or, or, or a planetesimal. What was that? Okay. Amber Alert, they're looking... Brandon, they're looking for you. No. St. Petersburg. It's down in St. Pete. Oh, God. Every time I hear that, you guys are too young to remember it, but by God, you know, when I was a little kid, we lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a little shrimpy kid. And that was the closest we've ever come to nuclear war with Russia. And so every time I hear an alert like that, that's what I think. Oh, the Russians are. 
you guys are laughing, but I don't laugh about it one bit. I just, you know. It's all right. It's an Amber Alert. That's the thing that, you know, or if I'm listening to ESPN radio and the, and the sound goes off, I think, oh, damn, the Russians have nuked the United States and they took all, out all our satellites, you know, because that they can do that. And that would, you know, if they do that, then we won't have any communication. So, but usually it's something terrestrial and, you know, civil Amber Alert. Hopefully they find that little kid. Anyways, let's get back to this. So the, so the question is, um, why is there, you know, why are the, you know, why aren't things always circular? And the answer is nature itself doesn't have a whole lot of symmetry when it assembles into a solar system. And once the solar system assembles itself, it can make any individual object take on really elongated elliptical orbits. Prime example being comets. Many of the comets were sucked in just enough by Jupiter to change their orbit into one that kicks them way, way out there and way far out beyond Pluto out in the Kuiper belt or out in the Oort cloud, which we'll be studying in the next week or so. And so nature just doesn't, you know, I mean, physicists think of things as perfect spheres, but, you know, to, in order to work things out. But Kepler's the one that said, boy, spheres are out. Circles are out. It's only ellipses. One more question. Okay, I see the bat signal out here up in the up in the uh, by the aisle. They're very good. All right, here's here comes Mercury. All right, so try to sketch in Mercury. Uh, and and then Venus is in between there. No. Now these orbits are all the right sizes relative to Earth, and they're all pretty close to the right shape, and they're all oriented to the Sun being at one of the foci. The sem and and I'll make a side note to you. The, sem the semi-major axis of all three ellipses is along the x y or along the x axis. Now, in nature, they might not be. So, in other words, the 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 semi-major or the major axis of Mercury might be tilted up a few degrees relative to this. But if they were all at the same line of the you know the semi-major axes were on top of each other this is what they'd look like all right now um so we got mercury we have earth and and actually you can see with with mercury quite a bit more eccentricity so you know it's definitely uh oblong but what about wild two what about pluto we had those in the table as well all right let's get to that uh, you better draw yourself another one. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit, well, not a little bit smaller, quite a bit smaller. Uh, about 40 times uh, smaller astronomical unit. And so um, there's the sun. Uh, and the sun is, this is the big green dot for the SUN. And in this scale, Pluto is is this size. Now this is Pluto centered. All right? Just like I did with Earth. I I centered Earth, I centered Mars, I centered well, I didn't center Mercury, but I centered Mars first and then I budged it. Here's where Pluto really would be. All right? Try to sketch that now. All right? Now, I'm going to actually um put wild 2 in this orbit or in 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 this picture. Wild 2 is out past Earth. It's got a big semi-major axis way out there. Uh, what was the semi-major for Wild 2? What do your notes say? I don't have my 3.44. Yeah. yeah, okay. So Wild 2 is out past um, Earth. Its semi-major axis is out past Mars. 
It's highly elliptical. Um, and here's Pluto, really big orbit and highly elliptical. And then here's um, Wild 2. Ding! Wild 2. It's teeny. It's really small. Now, I'm going to remove the S-U-N there. All right. So there is wild, too, that little yellow blip in there. All right. So that's Pluto. And inside that yellow thing is Earth, Earth's orbit, at least inside the, uh, the apogee or the aphelion. Here's aphelion way out here to the left. And here's aphelion for Pluto out here to the left. Now, um, so there's Wild 2, and here's Pluto. You can go ahead and label your diagram. Uh, and the wisdom, Matt, for this is our solar system is enormous. If we think about Earth's orbit as the fundamental unit. And our, our solar system is, is jack. I mean... It's very common to see stars like the sun. So we're guessing that there's a lot of solar systems like ours. And we know that there's other solar systems. We have found them in the last 5, 10 years uh, with bigger orbits than this. So it's, it's kind of humbling. And that's a good attitude to have when you're observing the universe. All right, here's a close-up. There's Wild 2. And now I've, I've put Pluto uh, up to an even bigger scale. Uh, so it almost fills the top to bottom of the screen. And this black ellipse here. Now, Earth's orbit, I'm burning it in. Earth's orbit is this red circle. All right, so it's inside the semi-major axis. It's inside, it's in, um, inside aphelion, and it's inside perihelion of Wild 2. So Wild 2 goes further out. But it, it does cut a little bit closer to Earth uh, than uh, you know Earth's you know Earth's orbit. Now the thing about Wild Two is um, it's not really going to uh, hit Earth or anything like that, so we should be okay. All right. Now, uh, final comment to you as you sketch in uh, the red orbit for Earth. I am going to PDF these slides. Uh, so that you just keep a hold of them and look at them. I, I know, because I know it's hard to sketch really well, and some of you may not be uh, Leonardo da Vinci Jr. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll PDF these and and you can and use them. All right. Now questions about this before we continue. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk about this baby. NWA 7034. Uh, this is the official name of this meteorite. It's a chunk of Mars. And at the end of last class, I told you why we know that. If you look at it, NWA, it has that black crust. Look at this. This is the actual... You know, they picked it up out in the desert in Northwest Africa. NWA stands for Northwest Africa. They bought it in uh, Morocco, but the guy that they bought it from didn't know exactly where it was picked up. Apparently, there's, there's people out in the desert uh, um, now uh, in Africa, in the Sahara, that, that know to look for dark rocks like this. Matter of fact, if you're ever here in Florida... Our bedrock is limestone. And so we have a lot of sand. And then we have a lot of, and then the bedrock is limestone. And limestone is light colored. And it's not very heavy. It's porous. And you can sometimes see, she, you can sometimes observe crustaceans. I'm not going to try to say 
C, seashells. There I did it. Okay. Anyways, you can see seashells in limestone sometimes, depending on where you get it. Uh, if you ever see a rock like this in Florida, pick it up and bring it here to the physics department. And we got guys that'll analyze the you know what out of it. We have asteroid and meteorite experts here in the Department of Physics, and they would love to see in even a tiny one. Now, if you're by the railroad tracks, it's probably not an asteroid. It might have fallen off a coal train or something like that. Uh, same about the highway. But if you're out in the boonies, you know, hiking or, or boating or something like that, um, yeah. yeah, pick it up. Question. Comment. Dude, they are sold for zillions. Well, not zillions, but, you know, you're talking about a little, a little, depending. I mean, if it's from Mars, but you don't know that when you pick it up. But if somebody analyzes it and it's from Mars, you just want a, a small lottery, my friend. Yeah. And see what they're doing here? If you look at that picture, you can see that they took a really good diamond saw and they sawed off a little slice of it, like a little piece of roast beef. And it, here's, the, here's the little nugget down here. And then they sell those. They sell to geologists, you know, guys with these beady eyes and big thick glasses and stuff and all kind of machines and stuff like that. And they analyze, you know, all they need is a slice to analyze. And so this guy uh, is probably doing okay. Question. Comment. Is this, is this the first, uh, is this the first one found? No, it's another 7,034. So, but, but we've, but in Northwest Africa, but I don't know what the first meteorite is that they determined was from Mars, but they're probably trying to analyze every single one that they can. That looks, you know, this one looks rocky. As a matter of fact, it is a rock. That's a piece of, uh, it's, it, it's a lot like basalt here on Earth. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Hawaii. A couple people. Uh, Hawaii, the other vacation land after Florida. Uh, and they don't have white beaches out there. A lot of times they have uh, black beaches. From the rock that they have out there, which looks a lot like this, okay? So we find the similar rock up there uh, all over Mars now. Now that we've been there a couple times, it's, it's pretty impressive. But um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to figure out which... I'm sure you can look it up. The first one that they figured out was from Mars. The, the reason we know stuff is from Mars is because um, we can analyze the minerals... And then compare them to the Viking, the, the very first lander to land on Mars successfully and analyze the soil and the atmosphere were two NASA landers back in the 70s, the Viking landers. And ever since then, and we've been putting more equipment up there as the years go by. We got a bunch of them up there. And so I'll never forget, you know, this. This there's a there's a, a very very famous Martian meteorite called ALA. Go ahead and write this down. ALH eight four zero zero one. ALH eight four zero zero one. And it is a meteorite that was found in Antarctica, in a place called Allen Hills. The Allen Hills. Ice field. ALH stands for Allen and then Hills. And it's number 84. Oh, it was discovered in uh, 1984, and it was the first one that they discovered there. So 84001. Allen Hills, 84001. When they found that and they started to saw it open, they found little bubbles of glass, little spheres of glass. And what that signified was that the, you know, it was a piece of Mars that was blasted off when another asteroid hit Mars. 
and blasted a lot of fragments of Mars out to space, and a bunch of them eventually hit the ground on Earth in Antarctica, the Allen Hills Ice Field. And it melted. It was so hot on impact that it melted, and then it was ejected into space and immediately cooled off. So it melted and then cooled off and formed little bubbles of glass. And we could, I mean, glass itself. You know what glass is? Clear glass? Sand. Melted sand. And you cool it in the right conditions, you get glass. And that's so that, so, but in, inside each of those little bubbles of glass was a teeny little hole, a teeny little bubble. And inside that was a little teeny bit of the Martian atmosphere. They thought, and when they analyzed it, they said, by God, this thing has got the same stuff inside these little tiny bubbles as the Viking lander found in the 70s. But you know what else they found? And this is why it's a famous meteorite. Some people think that they found a fossil of a life form inside that meteorite. And it's controversial. Life on Mars. Allen Hills 84001. ALH 84001. Look it up in your book. It, uh, it's probably in the index. Question. Uh, question. Is it possible that we'll find pieces of Earth on other planets in the solar system or the moon? Uh, answer is maybe. I don't know. Uh, Earth's got a really thick atmosphere. Uh, but, you know, they probably... You know, moon's pretty close, so maybe up on the moon. But not Mars, because it would have to have so much energy, it would have to go all the way out to Mars. Maybe on Venus, but Venus, it's, it's hard to say when we're ever going to have people walking around on Venus. It's pretty inhospitable. Mercury, maybe. You know, because stuff will tend to go towards, if it's shot out into space, it'll eventually tend to go towards the sun, and if the Earth's in the way, then it falls to Earth, like Allen Hills 84001. And, uh, but if, you know, maybe Mercury, a fragment of Earth might land on Venus or Mercury, but most of them, if any escape Earth's atmosphere, uh, they might uh, it probably end up in the SUN. But, but theoretically, yeah, I mean, the Venus and Mercury maybe, maybe the Moon. So... Uh, anyway, so Allen Hills 84001, definitely Martian. And I remember, it, this is when I was teaching up at UVM. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this movie uh, with Jodie Foster called Contact. Oh, man, I can see hardly in. It's, it's an older movie. It's like from the 1990s. It's a movie about um, a woman astronomer that is interested in searching for extraterrestrial life. And Jodie Foster plays that part. And she has all kinds of scrapes and adventures. And then they find the signal and contact. And then they try to figure out what it means. And, it, and what it means is that her dad was a space alien. And that he's signaling to her from another planet or something like that. It gets kind of hokey. But it's based on a real life story of a woman named Jill Tarter. And I'll go ahead and spell that for you. J-I-L-T-A-R-T-E-R. -E Tartar. J-I-L-T-A-R-T-E-R. -E Jill Tartar, she's the real-life astronomer that that movie's based on. And she was at University of Vermont when I was teaching up there. And she, well, she came to visit and gave a talk. And she made an, a statement about, um, you know, uh, an astro a, a meteorite from Mars. Now she's talking about different things that we've seen from extraterrestrial sources. And I was sitting with some of my students and one of my students, you know, I, I told everybody, let's, let's, I'll give you bonus points if you go to this lecture. So everybody went. And one of my students was a geology major. And it's, uh, er, uh, Erica Taylor. And she was sitting next to me and we were talking about it and it was, she was into the, into the discussion. And when Jill Tarter mentioned this asteroid, yeah, we know it's from Mars. She said, Dr. B, how do they know it's from Mars? I said, I don't know. Why don't you ask her? So she asked her. And the answer was what I've been talking about. 
you know, that they've analyzed those little teeny bubbles uh, inside the glass bubbles uh, and found out that it's Martian atmosphere. So that's how they know it. And uh, as similar with this one. Now let's take a look at isotopes. So let's just do a review here. Okay, we know from last time that uh, standard mean ocean water, um, that's the isotopic reference frame for scientists, astronomers, anybody. It, you know, because if, if you analyze water, rainfall, ice on the, on the ice cap of Greenland, uh, you can analyze the isotope ratios in the ice that's buried way, way down, a thousand feet down. And they can tell a lot. You know, they can, they can actually use it to judge how uh, cold the earth was uh, when that ice fell from the sky as snow, you know, umpteen thousand years ago by analyzing isotope ratios. Okay, so not just astronomers, but, but all kinds of scientists do that. Now, SMOW is our isotopic reference. It's kind of like um, the temperature scale is oriented, you know, Fahrenheit or Celsius is oriented to the freezing point and the boiling point of water. You know, 32 Fahrenheit, 212 for boiling point. Zero degrees Celsius, 100 Celsius for, for freezing and boiling. Okay, SMOW is like a reference point in the same way. The oxygen isotope abundances that we talked about last time, uh, 0.03799% for oxygen 17. In the oceans of Earth, but not everywhere, oceans of Earth, that's what you get. Now, if you're up on the moon or you're on Pluto or somewhere else, you might not see the same abundances, and that is why we're looking at this. Oxygen 18. So the, the amount of oxygen 18 uh, for, uh, divided by the amount of oxygen 16 is about 0.200520%. Right, 2,005.20 parts per million. Okay, now another way to express those isotope uh, proportions, the abundances, is just by counting. And so basically all you do is invert the percentages. You, you go one over, you know, the reciprocal of each percentage. So for oxygen 17, there's one oxygen 17 for every 2,632 oxygen-16 nuclei uh, in SMOW, mean ocean water. Okay. Similarly for oxygen-18, a little bit more abundant. There is one oxygen-18 for every 499 uh, regular oxygen-16. Okay. So those two, two different ways to say the same thing. You know, to describe the relative scarcity, okay? And so try to make number three. Uh, we've already got that from the notes, uh, number two. Um, and number three, yeah, one uh, oxygen 17 for every 2,632 uh, regular oxygen 16s and one oxygen 18 for every 499. I don't know why. There's probably uh, some nuclear physicist at Los Alamos that knows why oxygen 18 is more abundant because it all traces back to what happens in the center of stars believe it or not um, and here are the pictures uh, I worked carefully to make the pictures of the different nuclei here's oxygen 18 here's good old oxygen 16 8 and 8 oxygen 17 8 and 9 oxygen 18 8 and 10 and the gray circles are the neutrons. Uh, and uh, now, let's say that um, your calutron or your centrifuge, when you've refined it, when you've separated the isotopes, um, let's say that your assay, your isotopic assay, uh, comes in at 4,000 parts per million. Okay, that's 0.4%. Right, so this is our example, okay? That's an isotopic abundance, uh, 4,000 parts per million, i.e., uh, one oxygen 18 for every 250 atoms. So the other way of expressing 
the abundance uh, or scarcity uh, of the isotope. Okay, so in other words, we have a chunk of a meteorite from uh, a moon of Jupiter. Uh, and it fell to Earth, and we picked it up. And I don't know if we have any uh, meteorites from the moons of Jupiter, but it's possible. Uh, and let's say that it assays out at 4,000 parts per million. Um, then here's some of the things that we want to know. We're seeking wisdom. We want to know why. That is the quest of the entire scientific enterprise. Uh, for instance, what was the physical process that led to this particular abundance of oxygen-18? And you do the assay for the other isotopes of uh, oxygen. Uh, you do the isotope uh, deuterium. You know, you try to analyze as many things. We're just doing oxygen-18 here, uh, or we're talking about oxygen-18. When did it happen? You know, when did the physical process happen that uh, put the abundance at 4,000 parts per million? That's the kind of thing that we want to know, all right? And so if you have 4,000 parts per million, you want to ask yourself why, you know? Why is it 4,000 compared to... SMOW, standard mean ocean water. So let's make a judgment call. Get your clicker ready, and let's do one more clicker question. And I think I have a couple more, but let's, let's do this one. Uh, and let me ask you, and this is going to be about oxygen-18 and about the abundance ratio that we just had. Okay, so let's say that you have a gram of water uh, that you found in a spacecraft that's returned from planet X, and it assays out to 4,000 parts per million, oxygen-18, divided by oxygen-16. Now, which of these four sentences would you use to describe that gram of water compared to SMOW? Go ahead and vote. Read very carefully. And I'll just make the following comment for you. Um, on a test, you're not going to have to memorize or do ginormous calculations. We'll do a calculation of some of this stuff today. Uh, but on a test, I would give you a table of abundances. You know, like some sample from planet Y and, you know, of a rock or something like that. And ask you to make analysis like this, make judgment calls like this. 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one, zero. Boy, 160 volts. You guys have got to get your stuff going. Very interesting. Let's take a look at this. Here's a spread of answers. A uh, bunch of you voted for A, majority for B, a bunch of you for C, and a few of you voted for D. And, okay, 4,000 parts per million that's a bigger number than SMOW. SMOW is, two, so 2005. Um, and so what you would say is that this water is relatively rich in oxygen-18. All right? Or it's enriched. Or, you know, some other way of, you know, saying it's, it's an oversupply of oxygen-18. Now, I want to talk about the oxygen or the isotope ratio. The way that you <clears throat> compare stuff numerically to SMOW is by figuring out this ratio called delta. 
And you can do it for any of the isotopes. We'll do it in a minute for oxygen 18, but you can do the other isotopes as well. And this delta calculation is a way to encode the richness or the scarcity of your sample. So if you have a, a moon rock that the Apollo astronauts brought back, you can analyze it in a calutron or centrifuge or something else and figure out what your percentage, your abundance in your moon rock is and then compare it to the standard mean ocean water abundance. And so you, 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 know, you do your measurements in the lab, you come up with a number here. You know, as parts per million or a percentage, whatever you want to do. And then you do the same thing down here. Well, you look this one up. Somebody else has done that for you. SMOW. You look that up. Then you subtract one and then multiply the whole shebang by a thousand. All right, so here's the procedure. Um, this isotopic ratio usually uses Greek lowercase delta. Um, so you take the percentage, as I said, from your asteroid or whatever you're looking at, you know, a little piece of stardust from the Stardust mission. Um, you divide that by the SMOW percentage. Or, you, div you know, you go in parts per million and divide that by SMOW parts per million. Either way. And then you subtract 1. Now, if you, if you divide SMOW by SMOW, if, you're, if your sample comes in exactly on the money, same as SMOW, you're going to have um, SMOW divided by SMOW in the first term there. That's 1. Then 1 minus 1 is 0. And so your delta, if you're right at the same um, isotopic ratio as water from oceans of Earth, you get delta equal to zero. But if you're more abundant, your fraction there, if your sample percentage is bigger than SMOW, that fraction is greater than one. Then the square brackets are greater than zero. And you get a positive number. You multiply it by a thousand. Right? So you multiply a th by a thousand, and that gives you parts per thousand if you want to go with parts per thousand. All right. So let's do a calculation um, with this formula, okay? And let's it, and this is real numbers for NWA seven zero three four. Okay, so here's your formula. Here's your delta formula for oxygen eighteen. So you take your sample, your NWA seven zero three four. You analyze it, you put that number up here, divide it by SMOW, oxygen 18 percentage. This is going to be uh, 2,005.20 parts per million down here. And then whatever you get from NWA, and then subtract one, then multiply by 1,000, so on and so on. All right, so here's what they found for one of the sample or one of the experimental runs for NWA 7034. That it came in. Not at 2,005.20, but at 2,017 parts per million. Okay? That means that this, this quotient here is bigger than 1. All right? It's not much bigger than 1, but it is bigger than 1. Okay? So then, and there it is, to uh, 5 decimal points, 1.00588. All right. And then you say to yourself, multiply that by a thousand, and what you get is five point eight eight five parts per thousand. Uh, or here's the see this this is not a percentage sign. That's a per mil sign. P E R space. M-I-L-L-E. It's, it's not used very much in the United States. I, I hardly ever see it. But that's, a, that's the same as per thousand, parts per thousand, per mil, M-I-L-L-E. That's, I guess that's French for a thousand. Okay. So, so NWA comes in at five point something, five and change, 
it's a positive number. So write this down. Delta 18 for NWA7034 is positive. Therefore, it is enriched in oxygen 18 relative to SMOW. We also know from other tests that it's from Mars. So the question is now, why? Why is NWA7034 enriched in this isotope, significantly enriched, measurably enriched relative to earth water. Why is that? As they say, that is the right question. And the answer to it is the following. Because of this analysis, we think that this isotopic ratio shows that there was abundant water, liquid water, on the surface of Mars many, many, many millions of years ago. Homework. Uh, I'm going to assign you some reading, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of build the reading assignment, just a few sentences telling you what to read into the masteringastronomy.com. So look in masteringastronomy.com by lunchtime tomorrow. It'll be due next Thursday, next Tuesday. You're dismissed.